My name is Gabriel Beristain, director of photography of Black Widow, and this is the Go Creative Show. Hello and welcome to the Go Creative Show, a podcast for filmmakers. My name is Ben Consoli, and today we speak with Gabriel Beristain, ASC, the director of photography for Black Widow. Gabriel, thank you so much for coming on the show. Great pleasure, Ben. Really great pleasure. Great, great podcast you have here. Oh, thank you. Oh, my God. I'm being drowned with compliments already. We're going to get along very, very well. <laughs> There's so much to talk about with Black Widow, your career, of course, beyond Black Widow as well. Um, and we're going to dive into a ton. But before we get there, just very quickly, I want to mention the sponsor for today's episode, MZ Education for Creatives. Follow us on your favorite podcast app, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube as well. And uh, all things Go Creative Show at gocreativeshow.com. We'll be talking more about MZ later in the episode. But for now, if you're just chomping at the bit and you need to know more, gocreativeshow.com forward slash MZMZED. All right, Gabriel. So I just finished watching the movie today. Thank you, Disney, for giving me an opportunity to watch this thing ahead of the... Um, ahead of the theaters, which is always so fun to get it ahead of time. But this is the type of movie you have to see in a theater. You really do. Uh, I think the experience is just so much better with these big grand scale films. Um, I think like a couple days ago, uh, Stephen Dorff got some press for having this really horrible <laughs> review of Black Widow saying it looks like garbage. It looks like a bad music video. I'm embarrassed for the people involved. I, I just, I don't understand where that came from. And I wanted to give you an opportunity to comment on that. If you've even heard it or care, it doesn't sound like you really get concerned with reviews, but I wanted to give you an opportunity to comment on that, especially when they start saying things like the way that it looks, which is exactly what we here at Go Creative Show are all about is the look of these films. It's just, I, I couldn't disagree more. And I'd love for you to comment on it if you want to, um, because it just kind of ties into what we're saying here about other people saying what you should and shouldn't do in the Marvel Universe. It just isn't right. No, absolutely. And, you know, I mean, again, I work with Steven and I, I respect him a lot as an actor. But, you know, to comment on that, I mean, what? It's like me saying, oh, well, it's a bad acting. You know, I mean, it means nothing. Let's let's really substance, let's be, let's be very specific about it. How can I tell you why it looks good or bad? I mean, it's got obviously a subjective vision. But the fact that we have a reason why every image in Black Widow has a reason to be there. We were not doing it just because. Mm. We were, the, the director was very shallow, very, 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 very thorough. The director was not using just shallow language. We talk about everything. She wanted to make sure that we were appealing, that every image there was make, having a function, exactly as we did it with the comic books used to do, the, the old original Marvel tradition. Every image, they were done by artists. No, no, they were not just shallow people just doing doing drawings and, and text. People that they use composition, use color, use lighting. And we were doing that. So those films, regardless of whether Steven Dorff or Scorsese are talking about the films because, because they make a lot of money and they appeal to a lot of audiences. No, no, they don't no, appeal a lot of audiences. They appeal to the collective dream. That's what they don't understand. The, that is, is that they are really they are understanding what the way the society is moving and how they move, and then they bring that element, and then they they are there, and they talk to those people in that way, which was goes more than just the, the apparential manner. It goes, goes more into the emotional level of that. So if we take advantage of that situation to also discuss issues that are important to our society and our times, like the empowerment of women nowadays, like the human, the human trafficking. And, and then we do that, and every image there, contrary to what Stephen said, is very powerful and very beautiful, and, 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 and it really is very much linked to the story. I think we have a fantastic film, a phenomenal film. Let's talk about the look of the film, since we're on that topic. And um, the director, Kate Shorthand, uh, Shorthand uh, is quoted in saying that when talking about the films that she was watching as sort of the visual rep uh, references to get inspired for Black Widow, she actually mentioned No Country for Old Men, which I thought was a really interesting reference for her. And I'm curious 
if that was something that the two of you discussed, was was No Country for Old Men also an influence for you when developing the look of Black Widow? Well, she, Kate, Kate loves to have reference, and she, and she brought reference to me, right? That, that uh, you know, I used to be very cocky and said, Kate, I hope one day we will be the reference for many, many people. So, yes, <laughs> yeah. I, obviously, I, I observe those references because I know what she has in her mind and what she wants to do. But yeah. I have to work on a different way. I have to take, I'm working for, A, I'm working for her vision. I, can, I keep telling in interviews that when you decide to be a director of photography, you are forfeiting now the capacity to tell your own stories. What you are doing now is you're going to use all your capacity of being a storyteller, because we are storytellers in our own right. Now, but put into the service of a vision. That's what makes us very interesting, that we, we work for a, another person's vision. So yeah. the most important thing for me was to get what was Kate's vision. Ah, in this moment, she's inspiring herself from all countries for all men. Yeah, what image she is particular saying? Javier Bardem walking down with a very sort of soft in the back. I, I know what she's talking about. I know what she yeah. really feels, like what she wants to see. But I now, I have now part of her vision. But now I have to see what is what the script is saying. What is what emotionally is happening with the character in this moment? What is what we are, Natasha Romanoff, is living in that particular moment? And what is the performance that we are getting or we're going to get? And then on that, I create my own visual style of the film and yeah. give it to the director and give it to, to Kate. And um, and that's what that's what we was. That for me, more than more, more most of films that I have made, to me, it was very important to understand this one because, because we are leading this time the spectacle. We are not just following the spectacle. We are not just saying, okay, this is the Marvel Universe. Let's just play, play along. Let's just go into the cart and go into the ride and just enjoy the ride. No, no, no. I hear we are going to lead it. And we're going to tell visual effects, stunts, Second unit, aerial unit, wind tunnel, uh, uh, robot arm, all all the units. That's what yeah. the emotion should be, and that's what the action should be, and that's what it makes it, makes it very very special. We have a question from Instagram. Christopher Sousa wanted to know if Tony Scott was an influence in terms of the film's style. Tony and Tony and Ridley, of course, they are great influence. I mean, they are influence, but but it's very interesting, you know. I mean, we're talking about films like uh, uh, they, somebody asked me whether I use twenty four frames, uh, I use forty five degree shutters, and uh, and uh, to to like the Russo brothers use in um, uh, uh, um, in the Avengers. I love it, you know, when people get involved with that. Well, and I, I I was telling people about it that 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 one of the most beautiful films where the 45 degree shutter, 23 frames per second was used, was Gladiator. Mm. Now, Gladiator was shot by, uh, by by John Madison. So John Madison happened to be my assistant for many, many years when I was a DP in England. He actually grew up with me as my camera assistant. Oh, wow. So, and, and, and he has been, and he's the, he has had the grace to say, yes, Gabby Beristein was a great influence in my career because I grew, I grew up with him. He took me from from when I was a loader. We were fired from the same film together. No way. Well, That's I, awesome. I took, I took him to the Basque country to do the film, the first film in, in, in Basque language. And we and we did many video clips and many music and many, many films together. So when I came to America, Johnny stayed on his own in England. And he was then, we started working for the, uh, for the, um, uh, for the company and uh, for the Scots. And then that with Ridley, and then the Gladiator. So then he used the forty-five degree, something that we have experimented and doing together, right? Yeah. So what 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 happened is yes, you take those elements and don't see yes, and, and and Tony uses all these wonderful long lenses on dollies, and, but but there are things that it was part of our 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 tools when we were doing commercials and when we were doing things in Britain. And that you went in America. So you have all those elements. The most important thing is, I know that it's very attractive for me to come to a show and say, oh, I use a 45 degree shot in that scene. You know what I'm saying? And then you say, oh, he <laughs> used it. No, no, I don't. I, I, I use whatever I needed to use. In this case, 
Yes, the 45 degree shot, there's 23 frames that the Russo used, that then John Mattison used in Gladiator, and that I personally used many, modestly apart, modestly apart, I used many, many years ago, then I didn't want to use them in Black Widow because it was not the right thing to use in Black Widow. Yeah. This is all about grace. This is all about movements that are not staccato. This yeah. is all about movements that are fluid and elegant and distinguished. This is, this is another language. This is female empowerment. This is not a staccato macho shit. This is a completely different thing. Yeah. So then, therefore, I, I, no, I don't want to use 45 degrees, 20, 23 frames per second shutters. I want to use something that really helps me to tell that story. And that particular scene, that is the most important thing that I want to convey to the audience. You don't, you don't, you don't have gimmicks. I don't work with gimmicks. I hate the gimmick situation. You have to tell the story. And you have to work with the story. If your camera is not a character in the film, if your lighting is not a character in your film, as David Mamet used to say to me, Gabby, your camera has to be a character. I, you are not crew. You are cast. Yeah. Your camera is cast in my film. With this idea of camera being cast, how does that change the way that you film? Like it. it because uh, we've had a, we've had a lot of DPs on the show, a lot of different types of philosophies about the way people shoot. Um, if camera is cast, then what does that mean for the cast? How are you integrated into the scene? Because um, it sounds like you're saying you're not just filming the scene; you are a part of it. And what does that mean to you? Well, you have to give you a very specific example. There are the, the, obviously this is an. an a tremendous abstraction because it's not about, okay, in order to be part of the scene, you have to put the camera here and not here. No, I think, I think the, the, the most important thing is to know that that scene, what this scene is to be is <clears throat> you need to be audience and you need to be really behind and you need to be really very respectful and far away. Yeah, no, you, it's like that when you're acting live. So your camera now is going to be observing and it's going to be there. But sometimes... People, you, you, there. You want to be there. You want to be very close to the scene. Like, uh, for instance, Kurosawa, when when he did the, the Last Samurai, she, he has a scene in which the grandma, the grandfather, a grandfather dies in the film. He's dying, and his camera position was three quarters back. One of the camera positions that he had, and a lot of the scene was played there. Something that you cannot do nowadays. Nowadays, the studios will force you to always be in the front and see the eyes of the characters and be the Come what may, you have to do that. So what I did in Black Widow, as I tend to do in several things, is try to have three cameras. That in, 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 in a way that there are not three cameras, one after, together with the other one. And what I do is, is one of the cameras, at least one of the cameras, go somewhere else and start trying to find those angles that it would be very important to see and feel like what people, if you were a person there in the film, what would you like to be? You would like to whisper? You would like to be respectful and go really far? Would you like to be hovering? Would you like to be just, you would like to accompany? And, And if you start thinking that your camera, like as somebody that is there, and then you use those terms. When you ask those questions, like, would you like to, be respectful further away. Would you like to hover? Are you asking that of the of the camera operator? Is that what you mean? No, no, no. You you ask yourself. You ask yourself to start creating. Then you tell the camera operator. Now, what you are going to do now is, is is that. So, if the camera operator, the steady cam operator, feels like it is do the movement, and then we need to charge and get into the camera. But in that particular moment, that absolutely. Typical steadicam movement in which we go around, that which I use, for instance, a lot in Blade 2 with Guillermo del Toro, and then we move and we go in. Yeah. But in, in this case, again, because I'm working for the story, in this particular moment what is happening is I want the steadicam not to do that. On the contrary, I want the steadicam to start very close, and when the drama starts getting very heavy, not to be intrusive to the drama. Now, in this moment, when she's saying something that I, I, I'm in a close-up, for instance, and the character is saying something to the, no, the character, in this case, the two sisters talking to each other, yeah. Scarlett with Florence. Well, in that moment, yes, I'm in Scarlett and she's talking, but now I feel like if I don't see them together, 
is not is not completely right. Now I need to see that emotion in 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 in, in, in Florence. But I don't I don't feel that I, I don't feel that I should just give them the cut. They will have the cut. They will have the close-up on Florence reacting to Scarlett. But what about if my camera now, what he's going to do, is going to start with Scarlett and it's going to develop and it's going to end up in a very intimate close-up of both of them. In the same way that you, as if you were there, a, a, fly, a fly, you were invisible, you say, okay, Scarlett is talking. He's talking to Florence. And so what is Florence doing? And then you move around because you yeah. want to see both of them. It sounds like you're approaching the cinematography almost like like a person in the room that's curious about what's going on. Like if you were in this room, what would you want to see? Where where would you like to go? Um kind of where that where does the action pull you to? It's an interesting approach. I like I like that a lot. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I and I always do it like I always try to do it like that. I always try to be like that. Because okay, okay, I come first of all I come from the tradition of the very strong Mexican uh um uh visual influence, which which I never participated and never partake. I'm very Mexican, very, very Mexican. My mom still lives in Mexico, but I'm not part of this phenomenal group of talented Mexicans. I'm not part of Iñarruti, Lubeskis, uh Cuarón's Del Toro, even though I work with Guillermo, that was one film. But I don't because I didn't make my career in Mexico uh, like they did. And they did phenomenal. They were really, really good. So when I went to England, where I did my career, I worked very much in the theatrical theatrical world. world. Mm. And in that, I learned, but, but I felt like, you know, I've worked with people like Ken Russell. So when we did, for instance, the first uh, promo for Phantom of the Opera, Remember the, the musical? I did yeah, the course. first one. The first one was done with Ken Rosen that we nearly burned the whole bloody theater. But 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 it was very important because Ken said we are going to do something that this video needs to do something. People are going to come here to see the musical and they're going to sit down in the theater and they're going to be watching the the, the the spectacle. No question, because that's what it is. It's a beautiful. So let's give now the audience in this promo. The only the only thing that they cannot achieve, which is to come on the stage and to be close to the actors and to feel them there and yeah. to see them, to see the emotions and see the face of the phantom very close and smell it and smell that. So that we, we've was never a- had that ability before. We've never been able to get that close to the characters before the way you experienced phantom. It, it, it's, it, you couldn't do it before. That's right. So that experience to me, that's a, so when I decided that when I started making more films, then I said, I want to take, you know, if I want to do anything in my life as a cinematographer, I don't want to do. I think if I want to have a gimmick, I'm not going to have a 24 frames, 35 degree shot or 23, or, or my gimmick is not going to be to shoot, never to shoot with a, with a wide lens or with a tight lens. So let's use all of them. Whatever I need to use, I will use. Whatever camera I need to use, I will use. Whatever thing I need to use, I will use. But let me try to at least grab the audience with my hand and say, come on, come up. Let's go and let's go close. Let's move around. Let's see. Let's be respectful. Let's move back. But 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 be there. Let's let's enjoy that tremendous experience to feel your, Scarlett Johansson feeling and speaking to our emotions. So explain to me kind of the setup of these of this three camera experience that you're having on set. So you're I'm guessing you're back behind the monitors. You've got you've got your three different cameras set up. You can see everything. Are you then kind of communicating with the operators as it goes? Are you basically saying to them like, "Okay, s- sneak over there, grab that shot," or are you leaning on them more to sneak a few shots here and there? Or are are you finding operators that you know are particularly expert in grabbing that special shot. It, uh, how are you operating those cameras? Well, it all really, really depends. If I can work with the operators that I normally work, they, they understand my style, that they like my style, they gradually they start. Yes, I do have headphones like you have, and I have my, my bank of monitors, and I have and I communicate with the, with the intercoms. Right, I do that. And sometimes to the annoyance of, of, of certain people, but I do have my intercom <laughs> with them, and I, I and they sometimes they don't know what I'm talking about because they say first of all it's the noise, and secondly you are whispering, and third your accent is so so thick that I don't know what you're talking about. But we know how you work. So I can they, only imagine they're running a scene that costs thousands upon thousands of dollars. 
the special effects, there's all sorts of stunts going on, and then they can't clearly understand you because you're whispering in the oh, the frustration. Can, oh, yeah, I yeah, yeah, man. Move the bloody cover! Exactly. No, but, I love but that. Fortunate, fortunately, less, it's less and less happening now because, because I try to work, with, and I try from the beginning to show people what they have to do. And I said, you know, your camera is very specific. We need to get that. You need to get that close up at all times. You have this one, this camera needs to be there, and we have to be very careful. Now, when this camera moves, you have... So what you find is once you explain the situation, the same camera operators start working with the grips and the, and, 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 and the supporting team to really achieve those shots, try not to block themselves. And then they, it's very satisfactory to see that suddenly the A camera said, OK, I'm doing this shot, and in this moment, what I'm going to do is I'm going to move it. So you can enter there, grab this moment, pull back, and then I go back myself. So it's very satisfactory when the camera operators do that situation, when they start understanding that now we need to work like a team, like a three cameras, and, and help each other. When I have operators that I haven't worked with, it takes a tiny bit of time for them to understand that that's the way that I work. Yeah. And, um, but once they get it, they love it. They enjoy it very much. They, 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 they feel like and now they are part of a, a, a choreography. There is no something. They are not. What I always try to do is I don't make films. I don't like film language to be just a recording device. This is not. I mean, I don't want to be as. I don't want to make my films like look like a Zoom meeting. Yeah. In which you basically in front of the camera. I think that that I always try to make that camera to be there. And when the operators feel that they are not just a recording device but they are part of the choreography and the action. They really, they really dig it. And they really come up. I mean, very seldom I have an operator that, that, that it doesn't do that. The only time that I have had it, I unfortunately had, a, 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 I have to tell him, I didn't tell him in the best terms and I had to be taken to, 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 to human resources now, because now they take you to human resources. What did you do? If you tell the operator that he's doing uh, something that you don't agree, uh, maybe I did it in a, no very kind terms, but <laughs> but important <laughs> in the old fashioned way, and uh, you cannot do it anymore. But that's been the only time that in which I have t- t- confronted an operator who did not uh, not only accept but enjoy and cherish the opportunity to be not only a recording device. And uh, but that's what I do is I put my camera. The camera has got a function in the scene. It's very important for me that they understand the staging, that they understand what they are doing, because I work with the director very strongly to make sure that the staging is going to help us to do that. Then place our cameras. And then we place the cameras in the most confined spaces if needed. We have a yeah. scene there, one of my favorite scenes in Black Widow, in the little in the little back, back room on the gas station, the petrol station. Remember, oh, beautiful, yes, yes, beautiful in them, which basically they come out and then the florist starts imitating the scarlet. I said, oh, you're a poser and all that. It's beautiful little scene. Yes. But before that, they're in a back room. They're in a back room. And then the, this is it's a tiny little place. And we're doing those things, Benny's camera with an amorphic lenses. And I stop and I put my three cameras there. And the challenge for that, for the operator. You got three say, yes, cameras I, in I, that I, bathroom? Absolutely. And I said, and the operator said, e, yes, Gabby, I see I can call it that. And they can give me the beautiful low white shot of the two characters there. And that will cover Florence and that will cover Scarlet. And the beauty of that is that we don't have to have, they, they, we don't, they, they, will, they will interact and we have all these reactions because they yeah. are constantly acting. They are not just behind the camera that we're doing offline. They are acting. So that's the reason why Black Widow shows very powerful because very like very very often we I shot simultaneously everything, which allows you to have these wonderful wonderful moments of uh, 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 performance. Let's take a quick moment and talk about MZ empowering filmmakers. Now, you want to think about MZ as like Netflix, right? But this is Netflix for high quality video based filmmaking education. So it's like the perfect subscription service for us here at Go Creative Show. Uh, And they cover all sorts of things, directing, cinematography, post-production, visual storytelling, and more. It really is such an amazing place to hone your skills. 
Now, when you go to gocreativeshow.com forward slash MZ, M-Z-E-D, you are faced with course after course after course and all the things that you want to know about, like we mentioned, directing, cinematography, post-production, and so on. But the coolest part about it is it's not, the, the content is really high quality. It's made for filmmakers by filmmakers, but the teachers are really high end. We're talking about people that are working in the industry at like an A-list level. Tom Cross, the editor of La La Land, is one of the educators. He's got a course called The Art and Technique of Film Editing. In addition, Vincent LaFerre, Shane Hurlbut, Philip Bloom, like we're talking about people that are working in the industry teaching you um, how to help hone your craft, how to get better at your, in your field. Like it, this is exactly what we want here at Go Creative Show. In fact, one of their newest courses is called Indie Film Blueprint. And it's a course that's basically a roadmap for how to plan, shoot, and sell your first indie feature. Is that not like exactly what we need to know here at Go Creative Show? And that's just one of so many courses. And yes, you can buy individual courses, but what I suggest is kind of turning it into the Netflix, like I told you. Become an MZ Pro member because then you have access to everything on their entire library. That's what I do, and that's what I suggest you do as well. And the best part is if you use coupon code GCS20 at checkout, you get 20% off. GCS, Go Creative Show, GCS20 for 20% off your purchase of either a single course or your MZ Pro membership. So there's no reason not to do this. Check it out for yourself over at gocreativeshow.com forward slash MZ, M-Z-E-D, MZ, empowering filmmakers. You mentioned the term film language quite a bit, and it's something I wanted to talk to you about because when I was reading um, a few articles that you've done in the past, you had mentioned Cabaret as one of your favorite movies, and you pointed to the fact um, that it, it has such great and strong film grammar or film language. Certainly, you referenced Bob Fosse and cinematographer. Um, so what what does that term mean to you? I, I feel like that's one of those things that people say they've heard it. They don't really have much of a definition about it. And I'd love to learn more about what is your perspective? How do you describe film language? And why is it important to have that? Well, uh, very much like in the comic books, what you have is you have a combination of elements, which is the, uh, you, you see a comic book and then you have a uh, drawing, color, text, right? So basically you combine the comic book is a combination of that. When Stan Lee wrote a script and you know, sent it to Kirby and said, you know, go and draw the images and come with the images and I will put text and then we put the color and then they created this amazing, amazing thing. But what happened is the, the person that Kirby who was doing the drawings, they had to figure it out, sometimes the story without the text or imagine mm -hmm. his own text. So then he was telling the story with images. And then what happened is the, the text came and it started adapting to those images. So what happened, what we have lost with film language, is we have lost what in cabaret, what, what, the, those visual metaphors that Bobby Foss used, the, the ball coming down the stairs to depict an abortion, for instance, just, just to give you a very simple yeah, example. Yeah. But, but we are well, not... An, an iconic example. I mean, that's... That's yeah, exactly. what you think about when you think about the film, yeah. But then we, well, we now we feel we feel like a, oh no, we feel a bit ashamed to use visual meta visual metaphors. Oh, I, I know these two two on the head we use we use the word two on the head. Yeah, two on the head. What do what you mean? You know, I mean, you, we are telling a story which is different to other stories. They might be similar. They might have been. But, but now we have different actors. We have a different dynamic. We have different variation. And the metaphor now could really work. Certain composition that are very important, you know. So my, when I define film language, it's, it's, it's our grammar that we should not feel ashamed to use. If we need to use a visual metaphor, if we need to use composition, and that composition has to be like a, like, a, like Orson Welles used to do. I have this phenomenal low camera shots with no with the reason that he was expressing something that in his universe was very important, but he was not telling you. He was using the image for you to understand it. What we have forgotten about film language, what we start to feel in a shape, is that we are not using the, that visual language, that we are not using composition, 
and that we are not pairing there with good acting, with good staging, you know, the staging that now that now happening. So television, in a way, is taking that from us and feeling a tiny bit more courageous. And then you see that in television, they do one very long sequence shot, and then they go from one camera to another character, and the character takes you to another place. Yeah. Sometimes I get directors telling me, oh, I know, Gabby, this is very, I know it's very obvious. Come that camera taking us to that one, yeah, it's all. No, it's not obvious in the context of what we are telling. For this particular project, it works. It works very well. Mm. It's like when you we talk. And, and we are getting, we should need to recover those elements that we have in our language, which is visuals, color, composition, staging, and combine them, and use them with creativity and with power and with energy and without feeling apologetic about it. I think that makes a lot of sense. And can you point to one scene, one shot even, in Black Widow that utilizes this idea of film grammar? When we enter, for instance, Dracov's office, Dracov's office, which is an incredibly spectacular place, right? Yeah. Dracov's office. So the, 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 the camera was... Absolutely, just bringing it, bringing it Scarlet, which in this moment is not Scarlet, it's Rachel, or Rachel disguised as Scarlet. Uh, yeah. Scarlet disguised as a Rachel, right? And then we come back and we, we started showing the place, the spectacle. But basically, what we did is we brought the camera even further. We didn't walk with the character, with the camera started moving unmotivated. You know, all these words that we have invented nowadays. So, oh, if the camera is not motivated <laughs> to move, I don't like it. So directors come to me and say, let's always have the camera. It has to have always a motivation to move. Whoa, 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 wait, 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 wait. You know, it's not, it's not like the camera should be always have that obvious reason to move. The reason in this case is to show that a spectacular place that was Draco's office. So what I did is the camera and I start pulling away from the character, the camera pulling away from it, pulling away. It doesn't have the same, it's not motivated by the camera that the character pushing it. Now the camera is moving completely on his own. My character, that audience member that we brought into the scene, is now there. And now we go high, and now we're going to show the whole office because we want to show that space with great splendor, right? But casually, no, what we do, we did it in such a clever way that we don't see Taskmaster standing there because yeah. we wanted to then discover and reveal that master later on in a, another very dynamic shot. So when the shot, for instance, turns and then Draco shows that master and we pull focus to that, that task master, then we discover that the character is there. And again, yeah. a very simple foreground, background, pulling focus. And many people will say, okay, it's been, it's been done. Of course it's been done. That's what we do. That's what we speak. But the verb to be has been done. And yet we use it very often because if you don't use the verb to be, you cannot show life. <laughs> yes. Because life is the verb to be. So it's a good point. It's a good pulling, point. Pulling focus from front ground to foreground to background is the verb to be in film. It's life. It's action. <laughs> it's discovery. It's film language. Don't be ashamed of that. Use the bloody thing. <laughs> Absolutely. I love that. Um, you had mentioned a little while ago that you chose the Sony Venice for Black Widow. I'd like to just talk a couple of minutes about how you came to that decision for Sony Venice and maybe a mention of maybe some of the lens choices that you had on the film, too, and why. The thing is, what happened is I've always been a very support. I always support Alexa. I like Alexa. I like the way that 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 the. the Ari came with a camera that was going to come with a beautiful sensor that was going to say, okay, if we are not going to use celluloid, let's try to be, be as close as celluloid and, and analog as possible. And, you know, all these romantics out there, they are, you know, still longing, longing for celluloid. Yeah. And, and yes, I, I long for celluloid, but, you know, if I don't have it, I just move on, you right? So yeah. now what happened is then, when, when, when people started saying that we needed to produce 4K, Alexa, in order to get a bigger sensor and bigger pixelation, couldn't do the 4K on the size of the Mini and the classic Alexas. So they kept it about 3.8, whatever. For some reason, the market started demanding that we needed to have a, um, 
a, a 4K. Yeah. Red tried to do it, and what they did, but they did it with a tremendous amount of compression. So then Alexa has to come, Alexa has to come with a bigger camera, and then he came with the 65, and then he came with the LX. What happened is Sony found the possibility to say, okay, let's get ourselves a bigger sensor, let's work on the sensor, let's have the option to do 4K, 5K, and let's just be able to use the size of our camera with our camera on that. We will not have the mini, but then we will do is we are going to have the Rialto, which basically you can and attach the, car, the, the, the half of the camera, and then you have a very small version of the camera that you can mount on Steadicam or you can mount on confined space. Yeah. So Sony did a tremendous amount of work to come with a camera that was still going to be a compact camera, that it was not going to be the R65 or the LF, and that it was going that needed long uh, wide or different wide lenses. Sure. That we still yeah, yeah. want to be able to use the PL or the our conventional optics, and 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 be able to cover the market requirements of the 4K and the 6K. Okay, I'm not technically minded like that, so I would be the worst person to ask this question. But <laughs> but it was obvious obvious that that camera for our film that was going to be anamorphic that we needed to have also conversion to IMAX that we were going to have to have long format lenses needed a camera that was more versatile than our uh, Alexa. And also what they did is with, they started coming with versions and those versions were uh, Venice allowing us to gradually be able to do uh, more slow motion and shoot with more frames per second and still respecting the 4K and the 5K. So all those those, those uh, technical advances that they were doing while, while Alexa was still dealing with the research to try to bring a version of the 4K that respect more or less the size of the conventional camera and be able to use conventional optics, Venice took over the market. And 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 and, and you, you have to celebrate it. And, you know, that was the right camera for the job and that was when we went with Venice. Absolutely. That was, I think, the only reason it was exactly the right camera for the job that we were doing. What was the lens package you chose to pair with it? We use... You use Panavision. We use the Panavision. We use the, 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 obviously Kate wanted to have a look that was very, uh, evocative and it was a look that she want, didn't want to have these sharp looks and she didn't want to be, she wanted to have a bit more texture in the film. So yeah. we went, we went for the vintage, the vintage, the C, the CE, um, anamorphic, uh, Panavision lenses. And then we use the Primo 70s for the, the shots that we did with IMAX. Uh, try to have more that the more old fashioned old fashioned. I don't want to use the word old fashioned, but the much more so subtle texture that the modern technology. Again, nowadays you can use even modern lenses and still get that texture. But it's sure. very satisfactory that on you and your monitors in your dailies, you start seeing that look already applied. And uh, and and we went for those lenses. So they they're beautiful. They perform beautifully. And, uh, and they were, I, I believe that they were absolutely right also for the job. One of my favorite sequences in Black Widow was really, I, I, I just loved your entire, the entire span of the film that was in Budapest. I was in love with, I love the, the, the fight that they had in the, um, that, uh, Yelena and Natasha had in the apartment. I loved that. I loved that whole my, um, motorcycle and car chase going through the city that, like I had mentioned when we were talking early, like it, it culminated in the car falling through the subway staircase. I just, I loved everything going on in Budapest. What what I was sort of connecting with when I was watching it is, so we've all seen car chases in films before, certainly. But I'd love to talk to you about the way that you approached that scene to always let the audience know where you are. Because this isn't just a fight scene in one location. This is spanning. You're going through different streets. You're spanning the entire city almost. And it, it could be so easy to lose track of where you are in the space when you are doing a car scene because you're spanning so much ground. Is there something in the way that you plan and shoot car chases that helps the audience stay grounded? Well, look, every every job has got demands different situations. And then you have 
you know, sometimes on television, when I was doing MacGyver or Hawaii Five-O, either as DP or as a director, you know, they, you have to be, you have to economize. You have to be very quick. You have to say, okay, uh, uh, doesn't really matter. Just really where we are, as long as we see that woman and this, that car, car, car is going to go around and it's going to uh, uh, crash, whatever. The important thing here is that we need to economize, we need to be fast, and we need to tell the story very quickly. In Black Widow, you, uh, we have to give the credit to Kate. Because what he said, okay, you are going. I have these monsters. I have this Rob Inch, my stone coordinator. I have my second assistant director, who's got a lot of experience, and Carlos Carlos Carvalho, my DP of the second unit, who is wonderful. And I have now the, the, uh, um, Jeff Bauman, my visual effects coordinator. And I have so they have all these monsters and a person, and this lady who has never done any film about that. So what I was there, it was like a, the hand of the queen. I was the hand of the queen protecting my queen, you know, <laughs> against all these monsters and lords of the of the of the of the of the of the, of the, of the kingdom, right? That all of, all of them wanted to have, quite rightly. I mean, Jeff Bauman is defending the most the the, the 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 language of the Marvel universe, you know, the visual effects, and and is responding to this wonderful woman, Victoria Alonso, who has created a tremendous uh, uh, signature in the visual effects of our films, of the Marvel films, they look spectacular. And we have industrial light and magic. So now we have this lady who has never done this, saying, okay, we have that. you got to understand, guys, that this film is not about visual effects. It's about the emotions of the characters. It's about the logic. It's about what is happening. When they are going to have the bickering in the car, those two sisters, we need to understand that they have time to have the bickering. It's not gratuitous. So that was very important to have a director who was very constantly reminding all these lords of the kingdom, very powerful knights, that and me, he's the hand of the queen, telling me. I love the way you describe that, by the way. (laughs) It's just so perfect. That is not, is not, uh, that is not about them. That is not about, no, not, it, and I have to remind myself, it's not about camera, it's about the, the emotions of that. So those sequences were planned precisely for that because she was to, she wanted to check everything. And you say, well, and then they came, they, as we do it in visual effects. And, you know, I mean, a lot of that is the, the product of a phenomenal second unit, fantastic stone unit. Uh, we, we, we occasionally, Kate and I, will go and, and visit them and try to make sure that everything was as she wanted to. And I was checking the dailies on all that. But, but, but is that effort of that universe that is Marvel with a little variation this time, just don't do what you do in your kingdom, the, now you're working for the queen. Now you're working for the mm. story. This queen is not is not Kate Shortland, the director. This queen is Natasha Romanoff, is the film Black Widow. So make sure that everything that we do moves around that. And and, and, and that's the reason why those sequences are so emo- so powerful and so good, because they are related to the drama. And you see, every time that we cut to the first unit, to our shots, they make a tremendous amount of sense. It's not like a two isolated areas. Okay, they are here, they say something very nicely, and then we cut to something that happens somewhere else that is related or not. Here is truly, truly, truly related. And that's the magic of, 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 of Black Widow. What was the most challenging scene to film in Black Widow? Well, I think the, the, the descent at the end, it was very, very difficult. Why? Because we have so many units. You should see my tent. We have, originally, I, we have one tent. It was Kate, the, the continuity person, and myself. But all the technicians will come and talk to me at the gaffer, the grip, the every, the everyone, right? Yeah. And, and Kate said, get out of my place. Get out of my place. I don't want to hear all these technical things. So I had to build my own tent besides Kate because Kate kept asking me to go to her tent and talk to her. But I had to be in a different area. But it was perfect because I have, she had her main unit monitors. And I have a bank of monitors. I mean, it looked like I was doing a concert. Literally, it was like, a, you know, the fact that I communicate to the cameras with my headphones and the fact that I have a bank of monitors 
It truly looked like I was doing an Aerosmith concert, you know. Hey, cameras, come by, big camera. You are going to move, see camera, hey, steady cam, you know, you're ready, steady cam. You know, crane, crane, you are moving on the crane. No, it truly, truly was funny to see me there. But I have all the, ca- the units. But in the descent, we have, we have the first unit, we have the second unit, we have the wind tunnel unit, which is one of the biggest wind tunnels in the world. Mm, wow. Right? When we were flying a lot of stones. And, you know, the guy who does the wind tunnel is another lord of the kingdom, right? And he wants to do his own film. Yeah. Right? And then we have the robot arm, which we were flying in Scarlet and, and we were flying uh, um, uh, Florence. And, you know, that, 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 it, the, the, that it's very precise. And, and again, the, the, the robot arm unit, they, they are the lords of the kingdom. They want to do their own film. So you want to make sure that everyone understands. And the second unit, well, the second unit, by that time, they were already now working in our film. But, but you have all these units working and the aerial unit and all that. So, and we had this series of explosions and clouds and nights, and they come from cloud to black cloud to the sun. And, and, and there are different moments of lighting in the whole scene. So, yeah. I have to work with Jeff Bauman, the visual effects that all the previous uh, uh, had a note about lighting. They had to say, in this moment, in this in this frame, the character Scarlet goes from shadow to light. In this particular moment, there is an explosion there. So everyone was on the same line. I, I hate to use on the same page, mother of all cliches, but uh, that everyone knew exactly <laughs> where we are, where we in that situation, in that moment. And we wanted to be very sure that, and, and the point about it, the difficult, difficulty of that is that you really needed to be paying attention to those units. And occasionally you will see the, the wind unit, the wind tunnel unit doing something that it was not what we were expecting. I know the gaffer Lee Walters who is very powerful in England, and I strolling down there from one set to the other set to, to have, a, have a chat with the uh, <clears throat> wind tunnel unit and have a conversation with them about it. And You're going to end up at HR again, Gabriel. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, very likely, yeah. No, we were very kind, very kind, you know, very English, in a very English way. Uh, we're using, using C words and things like that. I is that is that your alarm? Is your fire alarm going off? I don't know. I'm, I'm actually at the. I came to a quiet place at the uh, ASC. I'm in the ASC clubhouse, and I came here especially not to have. But it's no, it's nothing mine. Is it very disturbing? It's yeah. It's pretty loud. Just keep it keep it going. Yeah. This is the American Society of Cinematographers for your your audience. This Look at beautiful, that. This is a beautiful clubhouse. There you see. Look at, see, we've never got to go inside the, the clubhouse oh, there. Oh, you, you have to. It's a beautiful, beautiful place. That. You got to get me in there, Gabriel. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So I have you. I have no right being there, but that's okay. Uh, maybe I can get a guest invite. We'll see. Yeah, <laughs> I, or, be nice. I organize it for you. No problem. Look, this is a little museum. So you were, you were speaking about the final scene and how you had all the different units running. It's the largest scene in the film. You talked to me about how challenging it was. Um, any other thoughts on that to just, yeah. So what happened there is, 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 is yes, this is technically this is what is important, you know, but that's the most difficult thing. Yes and no. It is what it is. If you're a new cinematographer, if you're a young cinematographer, you're going to be dealing with, with all the lords of the kingdom. And some of them are very powerful. And sometimes some of them, they might not pay attention to you. But mm-hmm. in my case, fortunately, I'm old enough to, you know, uh, to, to be sent to home, to home room, as I call it, to human resources again, if they don't listen carefully. And then I, I do it. But was that the most difficult thing? No, I think the most difficult thing for me in the film is to really stick to that thing. We wanted to make this a very special Marvel film. And we wanted those moments in which the emotions of the characters were transmitted really well that I respected those performances really well. And I think you see in the film that those moments of Scarlet, those moments in the, in the dining table in the farm, where I have the four characters and they're talking family, you got that mixture of humor and, 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 and nostalgic elements and, uh, and, and, and in which Florin said, you know, that was important for me. You are laughing, but for me, that was not fake. 
and and Scarly said, "Stop this!" and 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 they those two believing that they did a good job. The uh, David Harbour and and Rachel Weisz, though that beautiful scene around that table for me they were the most challenging one because they needed to look mm-hmm. right, as you say, very naturalistic. The style of that was to invade the set as little as possible with my lights. More, the way that I did it was this beautiful style that was I learned it from from Wendy Watkins, that very mythical uh, British cinematographer, in which he used ah. to put big wind bags outside the sets and find and, ba- and bounce very powerful lights. In front, in, among them, the Wendy, the famous Wendy light, and then let that light, that that glow, coming inside the set. And that gives a general texture. Obviously, you then you have to work inside of the apartment, for instance. The whole light comes from outside. And it's only in very few moments in which I have to supplement it to get Scarlet's eyes. Or when the widows come down in that cloud of smoke, I have to be very sure that they were not going to be obliterated by the smoke. And uh, so you have to put some lights inside and work on that. But... Um, but generally speaking, that tried to be as unobstructive as I could with my lighting, make sure that the lighting was always outside as much as I can. And I used that system in which you bounce a lot of lights in Draco's office, as you notice. Not only the light is outside, but is the, I have a series of shutters. So the light was in a rig, and I keep them moving up and down, up and down. So the light is constantly moving in a very subtle way, Throughout every time that you are in Draco's office, that we have beautiful, powerful scenes, the light yeah. moves up and down constantly, and there is not a single really? stand inside. No, I love that naturalistic approach. I think it's just so. It, it, I think when you're in a movie like Black Widow and you have these gigantic scenes and big stunt um, sequences and all that. It's really nice when you just have that natural approach to lighting, like in um, the Budapest apartment, like you were talking about the big single source reflected light coming through the window. I love that stuff. I think that's what makes you feel connected to these characters is when you have environments that feel really natural. I I think that's a great approach. Yeah, no, no, absolutely. Absolutely. And then we celebrate it. And every time that I can do it, I do it. I I like to have that, you know, very seldom I have to be... uh, very sort of uh, no no naturalistic. I love that. I'm not to the extreme to go to the Nestor Almendros that I will do it without any lights. You know, I like to have it. But you know, if I can have, I I I, I, I try to get all those lights coming. I like to have the light boxes if I need to have the light boxes, basically in exteriors. I'd rather have a light box light in just a general texture than putting big HMIs from different cranes. And uh, to 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 the for instance, we have the scene in which they are in the docks, uh, and they are having all these rallying all these little girls and little boys and little girls basically, and taking them. Yeah. And there's the army. I mean, it literally was lit with a big light box on top of that dock in in in, in Long Beach in California. That was literally uh, one big source of light. I love that. Now we're introducing a new segment on the show, and I want to I want to end our conversation with this thought. Um, we're calling it "Film Fails," but it's not all about the negative, because we want to talk about the biggest mistake that you made in your career and the lesson you learned from it. Uh, I don't see the problem. Is I I still in the process. I don't know. I don't know what I ever made a mistake that I regret. I think every mistake that I've done has been a lesson, but I don't regret it. I mean, uh, perhaps, I mean, I could tell you anecdotic mistakes. Like when that day I was doing a documentary, not the Hill Gate, and we load the camera emulsion up and uh, technical mistakes. Um, oh, no. <laughs> And then, you know, you get things like that. And then you obviously, you learn from that. But, you know, this is... this. this yeah, those are the fear. things you only do once. That is things that you only do once. And then uh, 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 that happened. However, see, very funny enough, that little technical mistake of low the, the motion up, uh, the motion up, I did it in Notting Hill Gate many years ago. Yeah. But then years later, I did a beautiful TV show called Magic City. 
right? I, you know, I'm going to give you that one because I think you want you want something anecdotic. You know, yes. I cannot give you I cannot give you anything really deep and profound on that. I think in that little what well, you prefer is the anecdote. So I'm going to give you the anecdote. So when I did a few years ago, like ten years ago, we uh, we were the Magic City, Mitch Glaser, the the showrunner, said, "Oh, absolutely, I want to do this film with celluloid. I want to have my TV show with celluloid. I don't know whether you've seen it, but I think it's one of the most beautiful TV shows." That was when I came with a new vintage Super Bolter lenses. My show was the first one to use the Super Bolter, and now everyone is using all these oh, vintage wow. lenses. But then, in, in a different situation, I will tell you about Magic City. I think Magic City deserves a full, uh, a full, a full chapter. Uh, but when when the the, the 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 showrunner was very keen on going celluloid, you know, normal, uh, and then the studio called me and said, "Gabby, forget it that you're going to go celluloid. It's no way." I said, "Don't talk to me." I said, "I'm not pushing for it. It's the showrunner that wants to go celluloid." He said, "No, you got to convince him." No, for God's sake, why do I have to get involved in all these things? Say, Dear, please, you you got to come in the Alexa is going to be the right camera to do it. So then I proposed, and that Alexa came, and I was a great supporter of Alexa. You know, at the same time, very nostalgic for celluloid, you know, obviously, as we are. Uh, you didn't, I didn't want celluloid to disappear. So now I'm here with my two, and I proposed to the showrunner, Mitch Glacier. I said, Mitch, let me just do a shot with celluloid and a shot with the Alexa. So you see if we can compare it. I was very, very keen. So I said, if I yeah. use um, uh, the Super Bolters, which are very soft, and I use that, and I, I started using maybe nets in the back element, trying to make sure that the digital image, first generation of Alexa, remember, and uh, and then I, the film. So again, I have uh, my camera system brought somebody to help us because that was all... Um, uh, speculative was all gratis, and uh, and he loaded the um, the emulsion up again. So, oh, in this case, not only was a horrible technical mistake, but the showrunner was totally convinced that I did that on purpose, so that the <laughs> film image was going to be a failure, and I would not be able to compare it. And I was that nearly, is great. I was nearly fired. I was nearly fired. No, it's nothing that oh, I regret, no. and it's nothing that I learned from. I didn't go, because is it the, lex- the, le- the, 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 the the lesson here is that you should not let an amateur or no a newer person to do that. No, I mean you have to do it. Is it, is that you should supervise every bit of work that people do for you when they are young and when they are new? Perhaps. I don't know whether it's a lesson that I learned. I think that uh, things happen. I, I love that. Well, the film is called Black Widow. It's out now in theaters and also Disney Plus. And um, Gabriel Berenstein, I, I, I'm so pleased that you came on the show to talk to us. I think you, you have really interesting stories and we could go on and on. There's so much more to talk about with your career and just in just Black Widow. But we appreciate the time we got from you that we did and uh, can't wait to have you back. Yeah, it will be a pleasure indeed. Thank you. All right, I want to thank Gabriel Berestein, ASC, BSC, the director of photography for Black Widow. Such a great discussion. And I I just love talking to these guys that, you know, they've been in it for a while. They know the game. They have so many really interesting stories from set. And uh, it's just so much you can learn from these people. So I really, really appreciate Gabriel and all the guests here at Go Creative Show for coming on and sharing their experiences. And um, I'd love to know what you think of the episode as well. So please find us on your favorite podcast app. Uh, Find us on social media, Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, YouTube, and let us know what you think of the episode. We would love to hear from you. Uh, You'll notice that behind me, I have my first of what's going to be many uh, little decorations for for my background here. The goal from the beginning was to populate this background with just weird little knickknacks. And I've been trying to figure out like, what am I gonna put there? I want things that make sense to me or have some sort of an interesting like shape to them. And I am open for suggestions. So if you guys have any ideas or thoughts on what could go back there, now is your time to let me know because 
I have a lot of space to fill and I cannot wait to start putting random bizarre things back there. It's going to be fun and you will see this background grow and grow and grow over time. So that's what's going on here at Go Creative Show. I also want to thank our um, our producer, Connor Crosby, over at ignitionvisuals.com. He puts the show together and, and makes it all flow so nicely. And Dave Siegel from Siegel Sound mixes masters and makes the show sound so good. So you can find both of them on their websites. And of course, our website, gocreativeshow.com. Join me on Instagram and Twitter at Ben Consoli. You can see what I've been up to. And of course, I want to thank you all for joining us today. And we will see you next week on another episode of the Go Creative Show, a podcast for filmmakers.